It's a long song. I'm going to read it for us completely, and then I'll just touch on some highlights here for us. The song helps to put into context our Christian faith and gives us the sense that our Christianity is not about me as an individual. Our world is a time in which people think that it's a Jesus and me religion, this thing called Christianity. But if we read together Psalm 78, we'll quickly notice how God has purposed for us to teach the next generation, and we would not be Christians had it not been for God's faithfulness through previous generations. So let's read together Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and a rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites armed with the bow turned back on the day of battle, they did not keep the Lord, they did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. In the sight of their fathers he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it, and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet they sinned still more against Him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that the water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. And he rained down on, the man, on their manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he led out the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings, and they ate and were all filled, and he gave them what they craved. But before they had satisfied their cravings, while the food was still in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them, and he killed the strongest of them and laid low the young men of Israel. In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. So he made their days vanish like a breath and their years in terror. When he killed them, they sought him. They repented it and sought God earnestly. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. But they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him, and they were not faithful to his covenant. Yet, he being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. How often they re rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His power 
all the day when he redeemed them from the foe, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the fields of Zoan. He turned their rivers to blood so that they could not drink of their streams. He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave their crops to the destroying locusts and the fruit of their labor to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamores with frost. He gave over their cattle to the hail and their flocks to thunderbolts. He let loose on them his burning anger, wrath, indignation, and distress, a company of destroying angels. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave their lives over to the plague. He struck down every firstborn in Egypt, the first fruits of their strength in the tents of Ham. Then he led out his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them in safety so that they were not afraid. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies, and he brought them to his holy land, to the mountain which, which his right hand had won. He drove out nations before them. He apportioned them for a possession and settled the tribes of Israel in their tents. Yet they tested and rebelled against the Most High God and did not keep his testimonies, but turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers. They twisted like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places. They moved him to jealousy with their idols. When God heard, he was full of wrath and he was utterly rejected Israel. He forsook his dwelling at Shiloh, the tent where he dwelt among mankind, and delivered his power to captivity, his glory to the hand of the foe. He gave his people over to the sword and vented his wrath on his heritage. Fire devoured their young men, and their young women had no marriage song. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, like a strong man shouting because of wine. And he put his adversaries to rout. He put them to everlasting shame. He rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. <coughs> As we open up the psalm this evening, I think many of us would testify to the great joy of being saved. When you see the mighty works of God in salvation in Christ for the first time and you've tasted something like Israel have tasted in being led through the sea as they pass through the dry, by dry land with the sea on their right and on their left hand, the marvelous work of God in salvation. But as the psalm points out, shortly after this, after they were established, after God had led them into the wilderness, people sinned against him. More than once they repeated their sins. Look at verse 9. We see the Ephraimites armed with a bow turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. Verse 17. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Verse 32. In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. Verse 36. But they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Verse 41. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Verse 56, And they tested and rebelled against the Most High God and did not keep His testimonies, but turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers. They twisted like a deceitful bow, or they provoked Him to anger with their high places. They moved Him to jealousy with their idols. You see, before our salvation, before we were convinced of our sin and our need of a Savior, we could in some sense plead ignorance. Lord, I did not know. How many of you heard 
someone asked the question maybe to you and put it to you and said, well, what about that tribe in Africa who's never heard the gospel? What about them? Will they also end up in hell? What about those people who've never had a chance to hear the gospel? My response to such people always is, what about you who's heard the gospel? What about you? You've heard the gospel. The judgment of God against those who have heard the gospel and still reject the grace of God is that much greater than those who have sinned in ignorance. And we find the history of God's people littered with this kind of action against him. At every point we read God had done them great and wonderful works of mercy and grace and salvation. And at every point his people responded with sin and rebellion and grumbling and disappointment. And yet, God did not destroy them. God's anger was kindled. His wrath became inflamed. And at one point, he even said to Moses, Leave me alone. Let me sit here in my anger, and I will destroy these people. And Moses interceded and pleaded for the people of Israel. Now, I think it is in line with this grace of the Lord that the psalmist then teaches us in the opening verses. He says, Give ear, O my people. To my teaching, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. The teacher here is pleading with the people of Israel, listen. And he's calling the people that he's teaching here, my people. Oh, my people. Oh, my people. How oftentimes if we read of the sins of people or if we hear of the sins of the people of God, we tend to distance ourselves. We tend to think, oh, well, it's their problem. But if you're part of the people of God, it's our problem. My people. My people. The teacher here is telling the people, in other words, I'm not elevated above you. Give ear, oh, my people. Your sins are troubling to me. Your sins are troubling to me because there are many of us who will suffer as a consequence of the sins of our generation. You will know that there are, there are much sufferings in this world that comes as a result of the collective sins of mankind. There are certain sins of our generation that is not the same as previous generations. And the sins of this generation is pressing upon us. Think of things like homosexuality, abortion, transgenderism. All of these things have consequences to those who live in a society like this. And the teacher here saying, Oh, my people, oh, my people, give ear, listen to my teaching, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. He is pleading with the people. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Now, verse 3 gives us perspective on these things that he will say, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. The teacher is not bringing anything new. He's not going to teach you anything new. The psalmist is not bringing any new knowledge, some knowledge that was lacking. You see, and much of our problems are that we do not pay attention to the things that we actually know and have heard. This is sort of a revision. It's not a new lesson. It's a revision of old lessons we've heard and we've known. So the psalmist is not intending to teach a new lesson to the people of God. He's intending to tell them things that they already know. Verse 4, he says, We will not hide them from their children. We will not hide them from their children. Our fathers have told us, and we will not hide it from their children. So in a sense, he's saying that the children, their children, will learn this, the children of the grandparents. We have learned this from our fathers, and shall we not teach this to our children then? Shall we withhold what our parents have taught us from our children? And so you already have the sense here that Christianity is not just about Jesus and me. It's about God and His people of which I am one. But it's also not just the collection of God's people here and now. It is the collection of God's people over the generations. Grandfathers, mothers, fathers grandchildren, great-grandchildren. 
We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. This commitment by the psalmist is to be obedient then to God's law as stated in Deuteronomy 6. If you will go to Deuteronomy 6 quickly. <clears throat> Shortly after the second giving of the law, God demanded through Moses of the fathers to teach their children. And so from verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Verse 6 is very important. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. These words must firstly be on your heart, God says. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house, and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that He swore to your fathers, to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of the good things that you did not fall, the cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by His name you shall swear. Very important that the Lord here commands us that these things will be on our hearts. How can you teach the next generation, how can you teach your children something that is not pressing upon your heart? The implication here is that we naturally tend to teach what is on our heart. Our children will see through any sort of hypocrisy. The next generation will see right through the hypocrisy of many of the so-called Christians in this generation. Hypocrisy is an easy thing to spot. Hypocrisy is an easy thing to spot. It's not an easy thing to come against and to expose it, but it's an easy thing to spot. We need to be sincere in our obedience to the Lord. The Word of God must be on our hearts. And we thank the Lord that through Jeremiah 31, He has promised us, through the prophet Jeremiah, that He will write His law in our hearts. This is His promise of the new covenant, that He will send His Holy Spirit and He would write this law on our hearts. Something that He commanded His people to do, to keep His law, is to have it on their hearts. But yet, as we read in Psalm 78, again and again the people sinned. Again and again they did not keep God's law. In Psalm 78 and verse 5 we read the following. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children. There is the direct allusion there to Deuteronomy 6. And he did so, he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them. That the next generation may know the commandments of the Lord. That the next generation may know the Lord. Verse 6 says that the next generation might know them, that the children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children, so that, verse 7, they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and a rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. In a sense, this evaluation we find in verse 8 is true of every previous generation. The previous generations have never lived up to the expectation of that generation. And neither will this generation live up to the full expectation of this generation. We will all fail somehow. We should not be like our fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. You see, within every generation, the generation as a whole, mankind as a whole, is still subject to the fall. 
But within every generation, God has his remnant, his chosen people. And God sets them apart. And God commands them to teach to the next generation, teach to your children. And as Christians, we not only teach our own children, but we teach in the church, we teach the next generation, all those who are fatherless, orphans. And so we propagate the gospel of the Lord to all of the children of the Lord. But it remains our responsibility. Our responsibility is to teach where the Lord has commanded us to teach these things. And I want you to see that the psalmist here presses upon the parents the responsibility to teach their children. To teach the next generation. Yes, it is the work of the pastor and the elders to preach God's word. But it is the particular responsibility of parents to teach their children. To bring them up in the fear and the discipline of the Lord. And you can see from the psalm and from Deuteronomy 6 that to teach your children means that the word of God needs to be in your heart. You need to serve the Lord with sincerity and truth. For your children will only do as you do. Your children will only follow where you have led them to. Yes, there are rebellious children who don't listen to parents. Yes, it's true. But in most cases, children tend to follow in their parents' footsteps. Children learn from their parents how to obey God or how to disobey Him. But we see that God has instituted this in verse 5 where He says, He commanded our fathers to teach to their children. God's promise and hope here is in verse 6 that the next generation might know them. That the children yet unborn and arise and tell it to their children so that they should set their hope in God. As we've learned this morning that the preaching of God's word is used by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes the word of God effectual unto salvation. Here is another means of grace which the Holy Spirit makes effectual in the lives of people. The means of grace here is commanding the parents to teach their children. And the Holy Spirit makes that teaching effectual unto salvation. So that both of these ingredients, as it were, are necessary. Many parents today sit back and they say, if God wants to save my children, He'll save them. I don't need to give any input. But that is not the kind of trust that God encourages parents to. God encourages parents to trust in Him by teaching. To trust Him by teaching, by instructing, and by disciplining their children. And the result, the fruit of such labor, verse 7 then, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. And the second result then is that they should keep His commandments. The Holy Spirit makes this teaching of the parents effectual. The last thing I want to point out this evening from the psalm is that we read of the events of history, but every time we read of a specific event listed by the psalmist, we have the word he, he. Verse 13, you see, he divided the sea. Verse 15, he split the rock. Verse 20, he struck the rock. Verse 23, he commanded. Verse 24, he rained down. Verse 26, he caused the east wind. Verse 27, he rained. Verse 28, he led them. The events of history are not mere accidents. They're not just random events. We see then that history is directed by God's hands. He has. He has. He has. How do you speak of his historical events? How do you view your own history? Do you view history as a random act of, or a random set of events that have, have occurred? Or do you view it as God's hand in guiding and directing everything to the purpose for which He has called us into existence? You see, if it's God who created this world and God who intends this world for the judgment in the coming days when His Son would return, that means that God has to be involved in every act, every small detail of history. 
and he is personally at work in history. And we must remember that when God is active in history, God is no man. God is not like us. When God acts in history, it is by his supernatural acts of grace. When God led the people out of Egypt into the wilderness, when God split the sea open for his people to pass on dry ground, when God provided manna in the wilderness and water from the rock, when God sent Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, into this world, when Jesus Christ ministered on earth, when he died on the cross and he rose from the grave, when he was born of a virgin and he ascended into heaven, all of these acts of God's supernatural grace, his supernatural grace toward us who would believe upon him so that we would be saved. And you see, we must believe that these are true historical events. Otherwise, we have no hope for the future events, the resurrection of our bodies, consummation of the new heaven and the new earth. You see, if God did not do these things which he said he did in history, how can we believe he will do anything in the future which he promised to do? And that's why it's so important for us to look back at the past events that God had accomplished through his people and for his people so that we can be reminded of God's glorious acts of salvation and grace. Just to encourage you furthermore, make use of our Baptist catechism. Printed at the back of our catechism is Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 to 7, to remind parents You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. What shall be on your heart? The words that God commanded us. What are the words that he commanded us? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Let that commandment be written on your heart. Don't obey God begrudgingly. Oh Lord, I will come to church. Uh, I guess it's your will. Oh Lord, I will read my Bible more. I guess it's your will. But love the Lord your God. Why should we love the Lord our God? You see, we can only love God because He first loved us. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. What compels our love for God? What causes His law to be written on our hearts? It's His love for us. It's by the work of the Holy Spirit that He puts His love within our hearts. And so then it is God who moves us and draws us and persuades us, bringing us to Christ. As Jesus said in John 6 verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And how does the Father draw us to Christ? The Father draws us with his fatherly love. And it's his fatherly love that causes the love within us to rise for him. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. If your heart is touched and is overflowing with joy and with love, you naturally tend to speak about the things that you love most. That person who speaks all, all day long about the rugby or the Formula One race or whatever it may be, Whatever it is that the person loves talking about. First thing we say about someone who talks about something frequently is, Oh, they really love rugby. Oh, they really love. Can your children see that you really love God? Can the next generation really see that you love God? I've met with many people who quickly and dismissively just want to tell me, I really genuinely love God. And the more they try and convince you, I really love God, the less you believe them. Because I hear it from your mouth, but I don't see it from your life. Let me see it in the way that you live. Let me see it in the way that you obey God. Let me see it in the way that you devote yourself to the teaching, to prayer, and to good works. But fooling people 
only leads to self-destruction. You see, we tend to think that when we have fooled someone else into thinking, yes, I'm a Christian, or at least when they think me to be a Christian, I'll be okay. But you see, one day we'll stand before our Lord. One day we'll stand before Jesus Christ and we'll say, Lord, Lord, have I not? What will be the things that you list? Oh, Lord, Lord, have I not? Will you say, Lord, Lord, have I not? And then listing all your good works? Or will you say, Lord, Lord, have I not believed? And you say, Lord, I know I haven't believed. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Our world is dead set against this kind of working of God in history. Many of the liberal theologians and unbelievers target special doctrines, things like the virgin birth of Christ, His resurrection. If these miraculous things did not take place, brother and sister, then our hope is lost. If there is only gain in godliness in this life, then we of all people are most to be pitied. Oh, woe is us, for we've set our hope on a lost cause. But I would rather place my trust in Jesus Christ, and I hope you would too. Place your hope in God and in Jesus Christ our Lord, for the salvation that He has accomplished for us is sure. And how can you be so sure? We have the Word of God, and we have the Holy, Word, Holy Spirit in our heart testifying that His words are true. And God will not put that hope to shame. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Father, we thank You that You are our Father in Heaven and that You are faithful to teach Your Word to every generation. O oh Lord, indeed, the Gospel of Christ has been preached ever since His ascension up until our day in an unbroken chain of events in history. And Lord, we thank you especially that you are not a God who is far removed from your creation, but that you act in this creation, that you, in a miraculous and supernatural way, direct and ordain all the events of history to lead to the salvation of your people. Thank you for your mighty acts of salvation. Thank you especially for those great acts of our Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he has accomplished by being the prophet like Moses preaching your word on the authority of the Father, the one who sent him, that he is the great high priest who has entered into the heavens and that he has sacrificed not the blood of bulls and animals, but that he sacrificed himself in our place. Thank you that we have a great king to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, and that he is seated at your right hand, and that he rules with an iron scepter, and as Isaiah says, to the extent of his government there is no end. O Lord, for us who are citizens in heaven, this is a great comfort. And what a great steadfast assurance that in Christ's kingdom all is steadfast and well. We pray that your kingdom may increase and that more and more may see and enter into your kingdom as you open hearts and minds by the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the great grace of our salvation that you have gathered us 
as a flock together and that you shepherd us. Thank you for appointing Jesus Christ as the true shepherd. Thank you that you build up your church into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And we especially thank you for the nature of our Good Shepherd, who is upright in heart and who has a skillful hand. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our true Shepherd. May you help the earthly shepherds who are under shepherds the great calling to be fellow shepherds of Christ and under shepherds of our Lord. May you grant us the grace to lead the flock with all boldness and courage, keeping our eyes on our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. May we enter through the door and not climb over the fence like the thief and the robber, but come to the flock through Christ Jesus our Lord. And, O Lord, protect the sheep by helping them to recognize the voice of the true under-shepherds and to shun the teachings of the false prophets and the false teachers in this world. Those who teach your word for sordid gain, to enrich themselves, but ultimately, O Lord, to the destruction of their own soul and to those of their listeners. May you guard us by the Holy Spirit and keep us in your grace. In the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. <clears throat> Let's stand and sing our closing hymn.